This podcast is sponsored by Glory Lost and Found, the book from the publishers of Airline Weekly, which tells the story of how Delta rose from despair to dominance in the post-9-11 era. Glory Lost and Found is now available as an audiobook on Audible and iTunes. It's also on Kindle and in paperback. Hop on Amazon and search Delta Book. We started this podcast about a year ago, and episode one was titled, Can It Get Any Better?, And we were referring to how remarkably well the U.S. carriers were doing at the time and whether they still had more room to run. As we often do, we gave our best guess. But today, a year later, in episode 50, we don't need to guess. We know the answer definitively. And? And it turns out they had more room to run, and then some. In fact, Delta, Alaska, Southwest, Hawaiian, and United all last week reported higher operating margins year over year for the second quarter. In other words, they continue to do even better. Uh, you, You left that American. That's right. They didn't do better year over year, but they still did the best of the big three by that measure. Weird, huh? I'm Jason Cottrell, Vice President of Airline Weekly. And I'm Seth Kaplan, Managing Partner of Airline Weekly. We're going to try to unpack the U.S. airline earnings reports so far. And we'll continue a recent conversation about Asul because they reached out to us with a little more insight. We always appreciate more insight. And we appreciate you listening to the Airline Weekly Lounge. Episode 50, coming up right now. Thanks for joining us. So American earned a billion dollars in the second quarter and posted an 18% operating margin. That 18% margin was better than Delta's 17% and United 16%. So Seth, does that mean American is the most healthy airline of the three? It doesn't, Jason. Uh, we discussed last week how Delta's results were impacted by uh, well, by how much it paid for fuel and also by, by the fact that it, it decided to actually you might say pay some more on, for fuel purposely uh, by unwinding some wrong way hedges, uh, you know, basically taking swallowing the pill now to not have to swallow even more bad medicine later, uh, particularly if fuel uh, stays as cheap as it is right now. Now, now that's real money. I mean, so uh, give American credit. It didn't have to do any of that because of its policy not to hedge fuel. Uh, but in terms of what this all indicates going forward, uh, all of that becomes less of a problem for Delta uh, going forward. Uh, so, you know, just kind of when you look at like net profits or, hey, you just sort of said healthy, I guess that would mean let's look at the balance sheet. Also, Delta is the healthier airline. Uh, you know, there's a reason why it's it's worth far more, for example, its market capitalization and so forth, uh, notwithstanding the fact that, that uh, American has has made incredible progress, and that a lot of its problems are beyond its control. We've discussed this, too, that Delta doesn't have any those those very particular pockets of pain in its network that American has. Uh, You know, Delta's exposed to Latin America, but it's not exposed to it like American is. Delta does not have a hub in Texas, unique in that regard among the big three. Uh, United, you know, very much impacted because of Houston. American impacted in DFW because of of, of the oil industry issues that, that, that matters in the Metroplex, uh, even if less in Houston. But, uh, you know, just then by the whole situation in Dallas, the build up at Love Field by Southwest, uh, you know, Spirit's expansion a couple of years ago in, uh, at DFW itself, although that's slowed. So American uh, doing very well by its own standards, very well by almost any standard. But when you look at all of it, h- hard to say um, that it has uh, caught Delta in terms of who's the healthiest airline. We discussed Delta last week, so let's not go too deeply regarding them. But Americans' results raise the question of who's the biggest airline in the world, Delta or American? Yeah, the answer is it depends. Um, I don't mean to hedge, but, um, you know, look, in terms of any capacity measures, for example, or, or traffic measures, you know, if you look at who has the most flights, uh, who offers the most seats, who offers the most available seat miles, uh, you know, ASMs, um, any of that, uh, American is is rather clearly uh, number one. But by what you might say is an even more important measure, just by revenue, 
uh, Delta surpassed American last quarter. And after all, that's kind of what you want as an airline. If you can figure out a way to make more money, even though you're not flying as much as somebody else who's who's generating less revenue, um, you know that, that's that's a pretty neat trick to turn. Uh, so yeah, so by revenue last quarter, you know, and all of these things vary uh, seasonally. Um, you know, some airlines just tend to peak in different quarters and so forth. So we'll, we'll have to see going forward if we can definitively say Delta basis is the larger airline. But last quarter, at least, uh, it, its revenue did indeed surpass Americans. Um, and uh, not, not, not the only time that it's uh, it's been right up there in the past several quarters with Americans, despite Americans' uh, larger size by those other measures. Looking at Americans' revenue picture, it does seem that everywhere they turn, they are under pressure. As you mentioned, in Dallas, they have to deal with Southwest and Spirit. In the UK, they have to deal with Brexit. And Americans, shall we say, venerable South American market is, of course, exposed to Brazil. Is there any place that things are good? Yeah, Brazil and Venezuela. You know, it's, it's, it's rough down there, and that's, that's huge for American. Yeah, you know, look, uh, domestic U.S., although uh, not as good as it once was, uh, you know, still better than most places around the world. And, and, and American, of course, is, is a huge domestic uh, U.S. airline. Uh, you know, you mentioned Brexit. One, one interesting thing they said on their earnings call is that they're actually more worried um, in the near term about core Europe than they are about the U.K. itself. And, and, and they said, you know, they, they can't say exactly why, because you know, people who don't book tickets don't tell you why they're not booking tickets. So all you can sort of do is say, well, what's going on? Yeah, there's Brexit. Yeah, terrorism. Uh, yeah, economic issues. Um, so uh, but anyway, for, 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 for whatever reasons that be, uh, when they're looking at their forward bookings, uh, they are concerned more about non-UK uh, Europe than they are about uh, the UK itself here in the foreseeable future. But uh, they did say that that Europe is the one major reason, speaking here broadly of Europe, including UK, what, the one major re region in the world where things are looking worse for the current quarter than they did for the second quarter, for those results they just reported. That's that's kind of interesting because um, some of the other airlines kind of sound more pessimistic. Uh, now, I have to say, Americans' management team, their history is that they're they're just sort of an optimistic group. Uh, so uh, sometimes, you know, you, you, Southwest could be looking at the same trends uh, as, as Americans. And, and it could sound like the sky is falling and, and, and American, it could sound American might sound almost irrationally exuberant about the same thing. So, so part of it's just uh, just the way they speak about things. But, you know, there's there's uh, surely some reality to the idea that American was just hit by some of the negativity earlier. Uh, Jason, you mentioned Brazil and, and other issues in South America, for example. Um, so, you know, that's been going on a long time. And an and American seems to at least think that they're kind of turning the corner in some problematic areas where things could start to bounce back. You know, as I said, this quarter, maybe everywhere except Europe. So uh, on, on a relative basis, it's not that things are great any of those other places, but things might be good actually in a lot of places. It's kind of what they're saying sometime here going forward uh, compared to where they were. However, having said all of that, the headline number, you know, when, when we're here uh, oh, three months from now talking about Americans uh, third quarter earnings based on their current forecast, uh, those earnings are going to look meaningfully worse uh, year over year. Uh, they're guiding a 12 to 14 percent net margin for the third quarter, the peak third quarter. Uh, that was something like 19 percent last year. I just looked a few minutes ago. Um, so that raises an interesting question about whether uh, things have peaked. Jason, you said it in the intro. Uh, we now know a year ago that, yes, indeed, things could continue to get better. Right now, the possibility exists that although U.S. airlines, again, by certainly by their own historical standards compared to uh, almost any airline around the world, are doing uh, phenomenally well, um, the possibility does exist, Jason, that um, perhaps uh, their profits ha have peaked, and, and, and American, based on their guidance, its profits uh, almost certainly have peaked, at least here for for the next couple of quarters. Um, and, and at this point, the uh, the the fuel comparisons, of course, begin to get tougher. You know, they were already paying rather little for fuel uh, a year ago, and then once you get into the 
the fourth quarter and the first quarter next year, you're, you're getting down to where they were paying very little. So uh, it, it's going to have to be a revenue story, a story of turning the revenue around because uh, you're, you're not going to have those declining fuel costs anymore. Certainly not going to have, uh, uh, you know, declining costs in, in other areas, but considering um, just sort of labor inflation uh, and the fact that all these airlines are, uh, are, are slowing capacity, you know, that's, that's good for revenue. Um, but it does put upward pressure on unit cost. When you're not growing, you're not achieving more scale, it puts upward pressure on unit cost. Uh, the idea, of course, is to get their hands around revenue, squeeze up the fares. Um, if they don't do that, then, yeah, they're going to be looking at some margin compression, uh, again, albeit starting from a very high level. That didn't sound too bullish, but uh, how bullish are you on American compared to its peers? You mentioned, Jason, uh, before that they ha had a higher operating margin than uh, than Delta or United for the second quarter. Uh, so that's certainly good. They're 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 right there in the middle of the pack among uh, uh, U.S. airlines, not doing as well as oh, and, and Southwest. But then, you know, almost nobody in the world is doing as well as as uh, Alaska. American, though, does uh, for all of its sort of near to midterm uh, or, you know, revenue issues does have some tailwinds that that nobody else has i mean first of all it's, you know they don't hedge fuel that's good uh when, when fuel is as cheap as it is right now it, particularly if it stays cheap but uh, they jason just signed that new co-branded credit card agreement basically extending their relationship with uh, uh with barclay which had been u.s airways partner uh and, and with city which had been americans partner going exclusive with mastercard every every advantage co-branded credit card by either of those is going to be a MasterCard. And, uh, you know, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in new revenue per year. Uh, that's something that Americans competitors had already done. Um, so, you know, they're kind of locked in. The, the, the results we've seen in recent quarters from them uh, have I've already included that. Whereas for American, that's all new money going forward. Um, that's rather easy revenue, uh, with apologies, obviously, to people who work hard to get those deals. You know, when you can increase your revenue by hundreds of millions of dollars per year without flying anymore, <laughs> you know, without having to do any of the real hard stuff and expensive stuff that you have to do as an airline, uh, that, that's that's a really big deal. So that's something uh, certainly that they can uh, that they can look forward to. Uh, you know, they've said Phoenix is 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 one bright spot where they've kind of gotten the capacity uh, to a point. I mean, basically reduced the capacity uh, modestly to a point where uh, you know fares have risen and where it's a it, it's a it's a nicely uh, uh, performing market. So uh, yeah, no, there's there's uh, there's plenty going right at American. Moving on to United, they posted a 16% margin. That's pretty close to Delta's 17% and Americans' 18%. Does that mean United is gaining ground on its peers? In other words, are they making it a three-person race again, or is this a one-off event? They are making it a race based uh, not, not only on, on those results, but uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago the guidance for, for the third quarter, uh, you know, helpfully. Uh, both the United and American happen to sort of provide apples to apples guidance. Different airlines do different things, but the two of them uh, happen to give uh, their expectations for pre-tax profits. So this is something uh, you know we talk a lot about operating margin. You know, then you'd have your your, your net profits, your net profit margin. Uh, so 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 the pre-tax profit margin is is a lot like net margin, typically lower than operating margin, but uh, not including taxes. And the reason airlines do that is just because the the tax burden can vary wildly just based on uh, you know airlines that have come out of bankruptcy more recently don't have to pay taxes for a long time, and it doesn't really tell you about anything anything about what's happening at the at the airline today it just tells you how, how many years ago they were in bankruptcy. Anyway, having said all that, they both guide the same way is the bottom line. Uh, American, I mentioned, uh, was, was was saying uh, 12 to 14 percent for the third quarter. United saying 14 to 16 percent. Uh, so there you are. You know, if they both come in in line with with expectations, uh, you know, unless American hits the very top end of that, that range and, and United the very bottom end, um, United will have uh, surpassed American uh, by that measure for uh, for the third quarter. So, um, uh, you know, can they sustain it? That's uh, that's a more interesting question. Um, you know, don't forget 
that United, uh, shortly after their merger, ha- had this window. Easy to forget now, Jason, because it, it just seems like they've been a laggard for so long. But where they were performing quite well, and, and then we all know what happened. The wheels uh, kind of fell off, at, at least on a relative basis compared to the other U.S. airlines. You know, we'll see. On the other hand, Jason, uh, you know, back to what you're asking before about sort of uh, reasons for optimism for American. Uh, don't forget, Americans merger was completed much more recently. Yeah, they have uh, one res system now and, of course, one operating certificate. But um, not all the synergies are in place yet. I mean, you know, for the most part, you still kind of have, you know, most of the U.S. Airways aircraft flying from the U.S. Airways hubs and 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 the American aircraft from the American hubs and, and other things where in some ways uh, it's still operating as two airlines, um, even from in terms of certain technology. And so uh, there's been a lot of upside there, too, uh, just, just for sort of really putting all the planes and people in all the right places. Uh, you know, that's an opportunity United doesn't really have anymore. They've done that, um, whereas, whereas American does have that going forward. And again, Delta just sort of generally the, uh, the more profitable airline. So, uh, so United has an opening. It needs to walk through that door, I guess, to uh, continue that analogy. Okay. In its second quarter report, United saw a 10% unit revenue decrease on transatlantic routes. Is that as ominous as it sounds? Well, hard, hard to, um, yeah, but too much lipstick on that one in the sense that, you know, some some bad things have happened even since then. Right. Brexit was in, in the very final days of, of the second quarter, you know, no, no meaningful impact in the second quarter. The terrorism, I mean, uh, just just in recent days, unfortunately, the uh, perception, at least among people booking tickets is, you know, gosh, it feels like every few days. I mean, and it, in very recent weeks, it has been every few days that there's um, some kind of an attack in, in Europe. Um, you know, just obviously all the economic questions. So, so yeah, you know, hard, hard, hard to be too excited about that. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're in the middle of the summer right now. So, so, you know, uh, a lot of the, the trips in terms of leisure travelers that would be taken during this quarter would have been booked before some of the worst of it. And a lot of those people are, you know, are going to say, well, you know, we already booked it. Let's, let's go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, in the same way that, as I mentioned you know, Latin America is perhaps turning the corner. You know, Europe, if anything, um, hard to be too optimistic about trends there. You know, although it's certainly hope for an upside surprise. We've seen it before, Jason, where, um, uh, you know, even in sort of some of the earlier attacks where you might have expected more impact on bookings after Paris, after Brussels. And, and uh, although there was an impact, maybe it wasn't all that bad. You know, perhaps going forward, we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll see that where it, it just won't be as bad as as you might expect. The burden of proof is on <laughs> at this point on the optimists because um, it, it's it's uh, there are a lot of headwinds right now in terms of transatlantic routes. Now we talk about the big three a lot because well they're the big three, but they are not the clear winners right now in the U.S. as measured by operating margin at least. And one of those winners is Alaska with its. 28% operating margin. Holy cats. In this week's Airline Weekly, we compared them to LeBron James in that Alaska is a star among stars. So my question, after falling down three games to one, could Alaska beat the Mighty Warriors? Yeah, you Cleveland boy. I guess it was only a matter of time before the LeBron James analogy uh, worked its way into the show, huh? Yep. Um, it's. I'm surprised it wasn't sued. <laughs> but, uh, you know, on second thought, maybe that wasn't the best analogy because Alaska never fell behind. Then again, they're not Stephon Curry either because they, you know, they won. Jason, I got to tell you, um, I like to think I'm right more often than I'm wrong about things when you, know, you ask me about expectations for, for the industry. This is one where I would have been wrong. Had you asked me uh, two or three years ago, I guess I'm lucky we weren't doing the podcast then, right? Because because uh, it's yeah, this isn't documented. But had, had you asked me when Delta was sort of really starting its assault on Alaska in the Pacific Northwest, if Alaska could keep putting up the kinds of margins it was putting up, my answer would have been, and you know, other people did ask me that, you know, my answer would have been, look, they're going to be fine. Uh, they're, they're an extraordinarily successful, well-managed airline, one of the more profitable airlines in the world. But there's no way uh, they can weather this storm with, with, with no impact. I mean, you just can't face the kind of capacity onslaught they've faced there without feeling some impact. And I would have been wrong about that. I was wrong about that because, uh, 
you know, here they are. Uh, yeah, just, um, you know, the, the among the two or three most profitable airlines in the world, uh, in terms of margin, at least, or standardizing for, for different sized airlines, still, despite all of it. Now, I guess one thing I, I, I didn't take into account, and, and you know, it's, it's something you could have anticipated, is that with the war between uh, Alaska and Delta, um, some other airlines would, would, would reduce a bit there. Uh, United is one that, uh, last I checked, scheduled to sort of quietly reduce their presence quite a bit in Seattle. It said, hey, look, we're going we're gonna to refocus places where uh, we can make money, places like San Francisco in their case, for example. You know, having said all that, you know, when you add it all up, Seattle is still a a very hot growth market to the point where there are now capacity constraints there. Portland very competitive, just in general, the Pacific Northwest. Everybody knows the economy there is good there, so everybody's piling in. Uh, you know, Spirit is in Seattle now, so yeah, they, but they they just uh, keep keep doing what they're doing. I mean, they do it the same ways they've always done it, just sort of deft. Uh, you know seasonal scheduling and then capacity management and then you know partners with uh, all kinds of airlines from everywhere i just saw got a press release today Qantas put its code on some new uh, uh alaska routes you know the, the, the killer frequent flyer plan the, the costly one by the way because they um uh, you know they buy a lot of miles from other airlines to say hey you know hey look you can fly alaska but you can have your american advantage miles your uh still your delta sky miles uh you know despite everything and so forth but it but it works for them it's money they're obviously very happy to spend uh they've got a new extra legroom economy product coming you know they haven't had something like economy plus comfort plus main cabin uh extra and so forth they're going to have one uh, that's so that's a tailwind to come that's that's not out there yet but it's something that's worked very well for all their competitors that they're going to have soon you know they were very early with the fair families and and uh, sort of branding their fares and uh giving travelers all kinds of options and they keep refining that anyway and on and on um and and here we are yeah with despite it all, still one of the highest margins in the world. Really impressive. Okay, let's move on to Southwest. They've been one of the big stories in this new golden age for U.S. carriers, and that story continued in the second quarter. Again, they are enjoying being somewhat insulated from the global economy, and they posted a 24% operating margin in Q2. That beat last year's paltry 22 percent yeah no it's it's great exposure uh you know i mean they're still a nearly all domestic u.s airline at a time when you know, we mentioned it before domestic u.s still about the best place to be i also m mentioned very briefly in a different context the fact that you know they um seem considerably more pessimistic than uh than american again part of that could just be the way the way both airlines always speak uh, about about things there are some some serious unit revenue concerns. I say serious. Uh, I mean, the context here is that Southwest actually has had you know, excellent unit revenue per, uh, performance, you know, in the sense that they've sometimes actually improved their unit revenues uh, as almost everybody else's have been deteriorating here in recent years. But the comparisons start to get tougher because, you know, Love Field, that buildup was finished now uh, almost a year ago. Most of it was, was, was uh, uh, more like two years ago. You know, sort of the 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 easy comparisons have, 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 have gone away. And you just have all of the other competitive issues, of course, the ultra low cost carriers, and just generally speaking, the fact that it's no secret domestic US is, you know, has been good. And so everybody is, is uh, getting more competitive against each other, you know, including airlines that hadn't always bumped up against each other, including L ultra LCCs against each other more, you know, Allegiant on spirit routes and so forth. Whereas, you know, uh, for, for a while, it seemed like they all had, you know, enough other opportunities that they didn't have to take on each other. So having said all that, Southwest, uh, yeah, really high margins. They always get the questions about uh, things they uh, perhaps should be doing, uh, the bag fees and, and you know the rest of it. And they got questions this quarter about capacity, you know, specifically, why are they growing when they're when the big three and you know essentially there are four giant airlines in the US, the other big three of the legacies, American United and Delta, when they're, you know, kind of not growing at all, Southwest growing somewhat here later in the year. That it all up and, and uh, they're making a lot of money. And this brings us to this week's dun dun -na, existential question. Mm. Seth, who'd you rather be? Southwest with its amazing network and its ability that is, if it wanted to, start charging for bags or Alaska, who has seemingly magical abilities to achieve dazzling operating margins. Mm, wow. That's uh, 
That's a that's a tough one. But um, yeah, I oh, wait, let me stop you. Remember, the existential question used to be between two miserable right. airlines. And yeah, this is just the opposite. Yeah. Who would rather be Air India or Pakistan International? Right. Um, <laughs> it's definitely that, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, yeah, no, I'd rather be Southwest um, uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, all things being exactly equal, I would always rather be the bigger airline and the more broadly exposed airline. Look, Alaska has done, as I said, an absolutely phenomenal job of withstanding everything that's been thrown at it by uh, by Delta. But, you know, it still is an airline um, concentrated in Seattle and Portland, Pacific Northwest and along the West Coast in general. Now, it's soon going to have a much broader exposure it's of course buying virgin america so assuming that all uh, you know everything sells through in terms of you know, you know, regulatory clearance and so forth so it's going to have huge hubs in seattle los angeles and and uh yeah and broader exposure but on the other hand uh, that does bring with it the challenge of uh, uh, of turning around what will then be a part of alaska airlines that has been the um the laggard in in, in the u.s industry if anybody can do it, they can. You know, they, they've they've got a great track record, and just consolidation per se is 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 very helpful for for uh, you know, for the industry. But you know, they've got that. You know, an airline that at least on day one is probably going to dilute their margins. Just if you look at how Alaska is doing uh, today, whereas um you know Southwest has the very broad exposure, you know, to just an absolute killer network, and and that Jason is. That's the secret sauce at Southwest. Just, just this amazingly dense network that no, nobody else can really replicate. I mean, nobody else can just have planes up and down seven times during the day, touching all these different cities, and uh, you know, basically dozens of hubs, whether you call them that or not. That's what they are. All these places where people can connect, and and uh, it all results in lots and lots of of corporate travel, friendly, nonstop routes and markets that that in many cases nobody else is ever going to figure out how to do because it only works if you can do it as part of this other thing and any day they want they can decide to charge for bags any day they want they can decide to go into the online travel agencies you know expedia and so forth any day they want they can start assigning seats for for a fee you know know, maybe waiving the fee for elite travelers and so forth uh although that one i think it becomes more viable once they get to the new reservation system. Anyway, all kinds of opportunities there that, you know, they have their reasons for, for not doing, but things that pretty much every other airline that's done those things has uh, has increased its profit. You know, maybe maybe there's something different about Southwest that that wouldn't be the case there. But it, it, it but it certainly is fun to think about. Well, if they're already doing this well, <laughs> then, ha- then if they did those things, might they be the uh, the uh, leader in the industry if they could add you know, maybe several hundred million dollars a year to their bottom line, if not more in, in the same way that other airlines have, have, have done when they've done those things. So uh, I think I'd rather be Southwest. OK, sounds reasonable. Uh, let's see. We'll talk about Hawaiian and Spirit and JetBlue and many other carriers outside the U.S. next week. I'd like to close this show with Asul. Uh, we were talking about them two weeks ago and we got the attention of at least one member of its executive team. Apparently, they are addressing some of our concerns about aircraft utilization on their long-haul routes. Yeah, and by the way, a a, a real neat opportunity to learn some more about an airline that's not publicly traded. Um, So, uh, obviously, all airlines have their have their secrets that they don't reveal uh, you know, even in earnings calls or in regulatory filings. So the airlines that we've been discussing, on, at least today on this show, for example, you know, they, they all publish quite a bit. Azul, not publicly traded. They at one point planned an IPO, but then you know, we all know what happened in, in, in Brazil. And that was even before the worst of it. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so they don't have to publish as much as, as everybody else. You know, they, they reached out and, and to say that they, uh, that they agreed with, uh, with some of the things we said disagreed with some other things and and uh yeah just just as i said more broadly just kind of an interesting uh opportunity to learn a lot more about them but specifically you mentioned the aircraft utilization Uh, i brought up the point that you know one just sort of 
tough structural thing about flying between North and South America is that you have inherently poor aircraft utilization, I should say, between deep South America and, and North America, in Argentina, Chile. Uh, and that's because uh, just the way uh, time zones work and so forth. Whereas, let's say if you're flying between North America and Europe or, or lots of other North long haul markets in the world, you could keep the airplane in the air most of the day. Uh, between North and South America, typically, uh, I said people want to fly at night. And precisely because you don't have a big time zone change, it, it just tends to mean usually, you know, the plane takes off from uh, Brazil late at night, arrives in you know, Fort Lauderdale in the morning, and then just sits there all day uh, because I said, you know, people don't want to travel during the day on those routes. They want to take advantage of going overnight. Well, Azul, uh, first of all, pointed out that actually in Orlando, uh, they are doing now a daytime rotation back. So they do what I just said. They leave Brazil at night. They arrive uh, in that case in Orlando in the morning, but then they do turn the plane back down to Brazil. And they said that they said they don't have a major impact. They haven't seen a major impact on on revenues. And they said uh, actually some families seem to uh, prefer it. So th there you might have a distinction between what I was talking about. Oh, people, you know, I was talking about corporate travelers, obviously the the ones who uh, you know who are more schedule sensitive, who want to take advantage of the overnight flight. But Brazil uh, or Azul rather, um, uh, you know, as, as a low cost carrier that um, you know sure is happy to have a corporate travel, but. Uh, uh, you know, big fee, fee, uh, focus on leisure travelers says that uh, there are actually some families that are happy to do it that, uh, you know, I guess don't want to uh, uh, travel overnight with the with the kids. Also, with Azul expanding its lie flat business seats from 20 seats to 35, we presume that was a way to cut capacity. But they're telling us that's not the reason. Yeah, 20 to 35 uh, per aircraft on, on its A330s. Yeah. So so what we guess was exactly what you said. Uh, that we saw, oh, you know, it's just taking seats off the plane one way or another. So just kind of trying to trying to make lemonade and say, well, maybe somebody will, will buy the business class seats. Um, and, and if not, well, it's it's uh, just the a, 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 a capacity reduction one way or the other. But yeah, they said no. They said that business class demand um, has been uh, reasonably resilient. Uh, you know, they said, look, with business travelers looking for value. I mean, you can imagine if you're a, a corporate travel manager in, in Brazil right now, you're going to save money. You know, it, it's uh, they offer a product that's competitively priced against against the other airlines, basically American and and uh, Tom or you know, now Latam uh, in the market. And um, they said it's just doing reasonably well. And, and uh, you know, they, they see it as a tool to bring high yield business travelers from all over Brazil connecting in their Veracopos hub near, near Sao Paulo. At least doing reasonably well, uh, you know, given the circumstances that that you know, uh, that everything there is challenged right now. And they tell us that JetBlue plays a rather big role in adding viability to its U.S. flights. Yeah, uh, you know, JetBlue, a big carrier, uh, certainly in Fort Lauderdale, also Orlando. Uh, they gave Boston uh, as an example of one market where you have people connecting uh, in those places in Fort Lauderdale and uh, and Orlando between Brazil. And uh, Boston. So they said that, uh, they, yeah, JetBlue actually um, makes a, a lot, a lot of what they do viable. Uh, you know, maybe maybe in a way beyond um, what we uh, what we appreciate. They did, by the way, Jason. I mentioned agree with uh, some of the things. Uh, just just specifically, yeah, the, the the visa situation that it's just it's very difficult for somebody to decide. Uh, you know, let's say to stimulate traffic, somebody say, yeah, let me run down to Brazil. I can't do that. Um, and and uh, that's particularly challenging right now because that's exactly what you, <laughs> if you're Azul, what you would want to be able to do. Uh, you know, Brazil is, is, is a great value right now um, for, for, uh, for somebody trading in a strong currency for an American. And they, they can't do that. And of course, the uh, I just mentioned the currency issues, the economy. They, uh, you know, they said moving the A330s over to TAP, which uh, of which they own part, uh, has um, they said been great um, for for TAP. Uh, you know, it's it's enabled TAP's new service to Boston and, and JFK. And uh, by the way, I mean, we mentioned before those date time rotations. Uh, they said, you know, being able to do that, they themselves as well fly uh, to Lisbon. They said that's that's actually been very. Uh, positive for them uh, they agreed with what we said about the olympics and and uh you know the world cup uh the olympics just as happened during the world cup stifling uh, corporate demand and 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 they said that'll uh you know that'll certainly be the uh 
the case here as well. Um, and uh, they, they said things are recovering, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, echoing what what Americans said on, on their earnings call about some markets. You know, basically, uh, they 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 seem to think the worst may be behind them. Just a couple of other notes, Jason, just because, like I said, this is all just such a rare opportunity to learn a lot about an airline that doesn't, you know, publish as much as some others. I mentioned the uh, the E one nineties and how uh, yeah it's you know fewer seats to fill good and thin markets but higher fares to cover the higher unit costs they agreed with that but they said they get those fares they said uh, they said the fares they get compensate and uh, they said in fact they have the highest corporate fares in Brazil even though they have the lowest average stage length so they're getting paid more for uh, flying fewer miles and they cited um, government data this is uh, something where you do have to file. Uh, certain data with the government in terms of uh, you know, fares and so forth, you know, they, they pointed to one thing in that data where, you know, they carry only 17 percent of the traffic by, by you know, revenue passenger miles in the domestic market. And yet they have 29 uh, percent of the revenue share. Tom, by the way, 29 percent goal, 30 percent. So, uh, you know, basically saying that they uh, punch above their weight and they, Jason, are very excited about the A320 Neos uh, coming in, uh, you know, I said, especially on longer stage lengths. You know, although, yeah, their E-190s work in certain ways, just having the, the larger plane is, is really going to hammer down their unit cost. And even as they take those, they are indeed returning some E-190s, placing some E-190s with, again, TAP uh, over in Portugal. They can apparently can make better use of them. So it's a, a, a lot of good information about an airline that, you know, uh, uh, that, that just that you don't tend to learn as much about just by you know, listening to earnings calls and doing the things we do about other airlines. All right. Well, thanks to Azul for sharing some knowledge. We'll take whatever we can get. <laughs> and thanks to you, dear listener, for visiting the Airline Weekly Lounge. We'll be back in a week to start on our next 50 episodes. <laughs>